I think one of the simplest ways of putting it is that the enabler is essentially the person who focuses on making excuses for the addicted person. An example would be if, uh, let's say it's the husband, father in the family who has the addiction, let's say alcohol. Uh, the enabling person will do things like call his work to say that he's ill or make up some excuse why he can't come to work today when essentially he is so hungover or he's so sick related to the drinking uh, that he can't make it in. If addiction uh, is happening with a loved one, we know that that uh, impacts the family system and the dynamic there. And there are a lot of things as family members and as concerned others that we need to understand about that process. And one of those is enabling. Uh, and what enabling is and what enabling isn't. Uh, uh, and specifically what it is in regards to maybe that uh, ineffective dealing with the alcoholic or uh, person suffering from substance use disorder. So I want to throw out to all of you right now, just kind of for some general conversation um, and thought, if we looked at enabling in general, not necessarily related to uh, someone who has a substance use disorder, what are some things that you would use or say to describe just kind of general enabling? If well, we were to look help, at that helping definition. someone. Mm -hmm. Helping? Just helping someone, yep. Right. Helping set up opportunities for people to use to help themselves. So setting up opportunities, helping other descriptors, other kind descriptions. Of bailing them out um, <clears throat> if they need money or um, suggestions for housing, you know, especially for an adult person that could do it themselves. Caretaking or taking care mm -hmm. of somebody when they're sick or ill. Mm -hmm. That's a, you know, it, it seems like it's a good thing, you know, at some times, but sometimes it can go into mm -hmm. something else. But just like general caretaking and taking care of somebody when they're not doing well. Right. Yeah. I think I think about rescuing too. I mm -hmm. think about, mm -hmm. you know, we're that rescuing's a good thing. If somebody's mm -hmm. drowning mm -hmm. and you help them not drown, that's a wonderful thing, and and it feels good when you're when you're doing it when you get to do that. Um, and then sometimes it just goes too far, where you try to rescue everybody, or you rescue somebody, or try and rescue somebody that doesn't want to be rescued and doesn't want to change. Uh, when does that enabling, however, uh, become problematic when we're dealing with a son or a daughter or a spouse? Uh, some of those very things that you described, um, why does that become a negative uh, mm -hmm. in terms of that process, both for them and for us? Well, it becomes a negative when it actually sabotages your own life and the lives of your family members. That it, it impacts what used to be your normal daily life. Can, can you give a specific mm -hmm. for yeah. that? Um, having to cancel vacation plans because you're having to be there for your loved one. Canceling events with families and friends because it's just not a good time and too often last minute changes of plans because so and so called and said can you come and help me with something and then you're caught in the in between but if you go to that rescue that would be the enabling especially because you've not continued with what you were planning to do so, in, in essence, if I understand what you're saying, we're letting their behaviors mm -hmm. affect us, mm -hmm. kind of their decisions mm -hmm. becoming our crisis. One of the things that was mentioned earlier was money, lending money, and, mm -hmm. and uh, we've all lent money, as I said before. Why does that change when somebody has a substance use disorder? What's wrong with giving or lending them money? Because they use it for drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that our daughter depended on our birthday money, on our uh, holiday money, counted on that. And as a matter of fact, um, called us up when she didn't get it and said, did you give my sisters 
you usually give money, did you do it? So it, it just enables their habit and becomes um, a negative thing. What about um, letting them stay with us or providing their housing? No, that disrupts the whole family. Mm -hmm. It makes it easy for them to continue their behavior. I've always stuck with the opinion that if my son is hungry and wants $10 to go get something to eat, I will feed him at home or take him out for something to eat. But I'm not going to give him the money because nine times out of ten, it's either going to go up their nose or in their arm or for alcohol. And that's, that's enabling to me. Helping is feeding them when they're hungry. I think because it, it, it makes them not take the responsibility that they should take if they're adults to provide their own housing. And we, it, we take the responsibility that should be theirs upon ourselves and then um, there's no reason for them to, to make any effort to change that right. because it's too easy. It's, it, we, we do all the work and trying to protect them. Uh, but all we're doing is teaching them to remain dependent upon us and not learn and grow and change. Let's talk about uh, a little bit about uh, how this happens. What is it about that kind of negative enabling that allows it to go on for so long and, and kind of disallows us the opportunity to see it or be aware of it until it's at critical mass? Our behaviors are also addictive. We may not be chemically dependent, but we get into addictive behaviors. It feels good to rescue somebody, so we keep doing that. <laughs> and, and so rescuing then becomes saving someone from a negative consequence. But when you're dealing with an addict, that's exactly what not to do, because it's the negative consequences over time that may make them get ready to, to really change behaviors and to get well. Uh, we, we just start thinking if we just do it right or if we just do it often enough that somehow it's going to change them instead of taking responsibility for our own behaviors and saying, okay, I'm going to decide what's healthy for me to do and not enable them uh, and kind of take back control. We give all our power over to them, I think. <laughs> Um, because our whole lives then start revolving around what do we have to do to, uh, to make sure that nothing bad happens to them and they aren't upset. And that's why it involves everybody in the family. So for me, um, I'm the kind of person that doesn't want to have any conflict. <laughs> so my enabling is <clears throat> I want to make sure that um, everything's smoothed out, whether it's in the form of giving them money or giving them a place or minimizing their transgressions, rationalizing what they're doing. And what Julie has pointed out many times is um, <laughs> that our daughter can read me and utilize that character defect or whatever you want to call it. And so, you know, she can go to town. <laughs> So for one person, it might be, you know, I don't want to have any conflict. I want everything to be cool. For others, it might be something else. But, you know, that to me is, uh, is how I approach everything with, uh, with the addicted person is, well, I just want things to be right and nice and really, you know, it's not so bad. And so I really uh, ignore things, mm -hmm. um, minimize, and kind of, you know, turn away, look the other way. Well, that's not to say that it's not difficult mm -hmm. because when our daughter was homeless, that is really, really hard mm -hmm. to let go of mm -hmm. and not to jump in there and send money and try to fix it. It's so difficult. I think sometimes enabling is just easier. Mm -hmm. Just like you mm -hmm. said, right. it's just plain easier, but it never stops. More just, expensive. It's, it's more expensive, <laughs> or uh, it doesn't help anybody. It certainly doesn't help the family. But Would it be correct to say that 
sometimes it's easier in the moment, mm -hmm. but yes. in the long run, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. maybe adds yes. to the destructive um, mm -hmm. process and uh, um, destructive impact on, on relationships. Julie, you mentioned um, uh, the letting go. Uh, there are those who, who, again, may hear that say letting go. Oh, I would never stop loving my uh, uh, daughter, my, my son. Uh, what does letting go mean? Does that mean I stop loving them? Letting go is setting boundaries, figuring out what I can and can't do. To, I can't control it. I can cope. And then, then with boundaries, the anger goes dissipates and I'm more loving, which when I was angry, that's what my children saw, the anger. And that is not what I wanted to come out. But I was angry about being taken advantage of because I didn't have good boundaries and because we continued to enable. Parents particularly have a hard time mm -hmm. in that letting go process. Uh, because isn't our primary role from the moment our children are born to enable them, mm -hmm. take care of them, protect them? Uh, so when that process changes or the, the change demands that we not do that to rescue them, um, it's, it's hard to let go of the fact that I really uh, can't fix it for them, uh, that, that uh, love alone by itself doesn't take care of it. Uh, and that takes practice, right? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look back at that part for you, mm -hmm. what was the most difficult point, uh, either in thought or action, in that letting go? What was the hardest to grasp or, or, or kind of get your head around? Just saying no when they wanted you to do something that you realized wasn't to their benefit. You just have to learn to say no, and you have to remember that no is a complete sentence. That's, that's what I've learned from this. Right. And if they disagree or want to argue about it, um, I just say, I'm sorry you feel that way. I learned too with a child that I love, it's hard when if you set a boundary and there's a consequence and the consequence happens and they just keep saying, well, why, why? I don't understand why. And you just get pulled into that. And as soon as you feel like you're having to justify the consequence, you're, you're stuck. You know, you can't get out of it. That's why we've, we've talked in the group, and I don't remember who, I don't remember quite where it came from. I know Jim brought it to the group, the, the STOP, mm -hmm. the, the responses you can make to somebody to, to get out of that mire that, you, that you've gotten pulled into. I mean, I, I've always been told, and I certainly believe, that it's, it's silly to get in an argument with somebody who's drunk, mm -hmm. and it's just as silly to get in an argument with somebody who's an addict if they're trying to further their addiction in the argument. Mm -hmm. So the STOP, sorry you feel that way, that, that Sandra just said, um, that's your opinion is the T, O is O, oh. <laughs> and P is perhaps you're right. But, mm -hmm. And those are ways of not, not screaming or yelling or, or uh, being disrespectful of the other person, but it kind of ends the, mm -hmm. it end, it, well, it doesn't always end the conversation. <laughs> I, can, I can adjust to that, but at least kind of, you're heading it toward the door of the conversation. As, as parents, we can fix anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, no matter how old your child is, and some of ours are in 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever, okay. <laughs> <laughs> at what point does it, do you get it? You know, it's at what point, and we didn't get it, well, I didn't get it until she was in her 30s, that I've got no control. And it's, it was hard to come to grips with, okay, how do you accept that? How do you, you know, just <laughs> live your life and don't be, uh, the one that has to fix somebody else's problem. I think there's mm -hmm. guilt too. I when mm -hmm. when I first began practicing working on saying no, when I knew that no is what needed to be said, 
even though logically I knew that that was the right thing to do, the, the mother's guilt mm -hmm. of, of I've, I've hurt him, he thinks I don't mm -hmm. love him, even though I said I love him. Um, and it, that's probably the part that's been the biggest struggle for me is, is to recognize that even though initially when I started to, to work on that, it didn't feel good. It, it really didn't yeah, it feel good. I felt like a mm -hmm. failure. Mm -hmm. But as I did it more and, and I started to recognize that he was responding differently, then I, it, it, it gives a little reinforcement to make it a little easier the next time. Not easy, but a little easier each time that you do it. Well, and don't forget that when none of us wanted this or yeah. expected mm -hmm. this in our families. Mm -hmm. And so I lost a lot of self-esteem mm -hmm. and, you know, was embarrassed and tried to cover up and fix it. <clears throat> well, as we've learned, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. We can't fix mm -hmm. it. What helped me get over the guilt finally, I mean, it's kind of always a little bit there, but having learned through this program, and it took a while, that this is a disease our loved one has. Mm -hmm. And just like any other disease, they're not doing it on purpose. Nobody chooses to have cancer or diabetes, just like they don't choose to have the addiction. So we love our loved one, but we don't love the disease. Mm -hmm. And also, when you said, Julie, about we're afraid that they won't like us. Actually, when we're enabling them, they don't like us because they take more and more from us. They abuse us more and more in their way. So once you finally set the boundaries and learn how to do that, um, you're allowing the loved one to finally grow into their own person. You know, and you make an interesting point because when, when I stopped enabling my son uh, and um, as he started to heal a little bit in, in those times between treatments for him, he said to me, when you quit enabling dad, that's when I knew you were serious. Mm -hmm. And that was empowering mm -hmm. and inspiring mm -hmm. to me because he knew even in that dysfunction, uh, even in his own denial, even in that spiral, being out of control because of his act of addiction, he was aware. And I think there is truth to that because in looking back, I know my mother, my father loved me because they set boundaries and they had mm -hmm. expectations. Um, and if I could have done whatever I wanted to do, whenever I wanted to do it, I would, well, they must not care about me. So there is kind of that paradox there.